beat the hell out of me. <laughs> sign down below. I know he's a musician. <laughs> <laughs> when was that? <laughs> when was that mean? Good evening. Good. Does that work? <laughs> Does it? Hi. Can you guys hear me? Voice will be recorded forever on the camera. So, so my name is Rita. I'm an intern here. I have a voice. I know. I don't know what you're saying. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Freddie Shift Love Live. The Lover voice is really good. Remembering Longpoint, a panel discussion on the legendary member artist gallery. Welcome to the Freddie Shift Love Live. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Texas. You can find more foundation challenges. Oh, nice, nice. This summer, oh, Harvard's work will be turned as art of another kind. You can have a little abstraction of the Guggenheim at the Guggenheim of the University of New York City. And in October, at Pam's annual Gala, Cicero and Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Gable, she's yep. somewhere back there, <laughs> will be honored at the um, Gala. Yes, the Black Hunter Chief of Awards. All right, and now Edward Geode. He was born in Waterbury, Connecticut in 1926. After serving in World War II, Edward Geode studied art in Boston and then in Provincetown with painter Henry Henchy. By 1949, he was set up in New York City, where he studied at the Art Students League. Early in his career, he was strongly moved by the term Latin Expressionism. Through the writings of Fred Federico Garcia Lorca and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, among other literary and artistic figures, he explored elements of their subject matter in his own work. His work is represented in numerous public and private collections, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Tate Gallery in London, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. And <laughs> All right, last but not least, Paul Resica was born in New York City in 1928. He first came to Provincetown in 1947 at 19 to study with Hans Hoffman. He has received numerous grants and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and election to the National Academy of Design. His work in the collections is in the collections of Dartmouth College, William de Kooning, Exxon Corporation, Joseph Kirchhorn Collection, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Academy of Design, the Sarah Hobby Foundation, the Weatherspoon Art Gallery, Greensboro, North Carolina, and Pam. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our brief bios about our four awesome long point artists. So please help me welcome Verujan, Carmen, Edward, and Paul. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me this far back? Yes. Can. There's nothing as terrible as having a speaker and you can't hear what he or she says. Uh, the only reason I'm the moderator of this group is because I'm the I'm older than the other three. <laughs> Uh, and we're going alphabetically, too. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I think uh, this has been a, a very special moment for those of us who were in the Long Point Gallery. Uh, but as I said earlier, we weren't the only gallery in town. At the same time, we had Rising Tide, we had the Group Gallery, uh, and, and there were other individuals working, not only in Provincetown, but in Wellfleet as well. Uh, it, uh, I remember when Leo approached me and asked me if I would join the group, I said, certainly. Uh, he and Victor Candell, of course, as you all know, ran an art school in, uh, in, the, uh, in the building that was owned by the American Legion. When they gave up the gallery, Leo thought it would be a wonderful idea to have a group of artists. We weren't the only ones who were asked. There were others who were asked who, for one reason or another, didn't want to participate in a group. But. I think it was a homogeneous group, and uh, we had various personalities, but somehow or other, I think we put our best foot forward and tried to put on exciting shows uh, for ourselves and for the community, as did the other galleries in town and the other artists. So. Uh, to have a forum about Long Point, I think uh, the thrust would be, what are the questions you would like to ask us? Because I think it's obvious we were here for a number of years. We put on a number of shows. Uh, some of us are still alive. 
uh, and uh, I think the show in the two galleries shows what what we were about. So, with that, I would uh, like to ask my colleagues if they want to say anything, or anyone in the audience would like to start off a question. <laughs> you don't want us to talk at all, is that the idea? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> well, I have to say this. Since this project started, this long point project, I've been feeling more and more like the last Civil War veteran. <laughs> I would say also that one of the most enjoyable experiences that I've had uh, is uh, when my wife was making this uh, very beautiful catalog. I had the opportunity of looking through dozens and dozens of pictures of the members of the gallery and it brought back such wonderful, wonderful memories uh, and uh, uh, that was uh, one of the most enjoyable uh, experiences that I had. There is something else that uh, you might find curious. When I was first asked to join the Long Point Gallery, I believe it or not, was not interested. And the reason was, kind of stupid in a way, uh, that I preferred fishing every day and I didn't want to <laughs> interrupt my fishing. And so I, <laughs> uh, I talked to Mary and we talked it over. And, uh, but then when I began to see the wonderful members in the gallery, particular, particularly Robert Motherwell, but uh, these other wonderful people as well, I decided it would be pretty foolish if I didn't join. I did, and I found it to be one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Uh, I'll put in my, my two bits. Uh, we knew of each other, or we were friends, with just about every member of the group, with the exception of Rick. Clover, who's much younger than we are. And uh, we're very comfortable with each other because we respected, respected each other's work and uh, years of, of friendship, of course, uh, uh, was included. And uh, we, we felt uh, 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 very easy about how the gallery would work. We wanted to have a good time. We we're not especially concerned about selling. We had already been through an awful lot, and we were already secure in our positions. And uh, selling wasn't, wasn't a major concern. We just wanted to show work that we wouldn't normally show, in most cases, in New York or at our commercial galleries. And we, uh, and, and we wanted to have fun doing it. And we had a lot of fun. We showed work that we would have never, in many cases, we would have never sent to uh, our New York galleries. And uh, uh, we, we took a chance with the audience, and they responded in a very positive way. They, they loved the, the, uh, the, 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 the quality of, uh, of our relationship. And I don't think they knew it was a commercial gallery to a degree, but it was more than that. And I think the public felt it. That's what made it unique. It wasn't uh, commercialism played a secondary part. We had to pay our bills, but when we didn't have enough, when we didn't sell enough, we put in our own money to keep the gallery going. But we put on some rather outlandish shows that became very popular, like from your studio wall, a section of who thought of that anyway? I think Bud Hopkins did. What a crazy idea! A section of your studio we would display in the gallery. So I cut pieces of lumber that that were that originally were part of my studio and I tacked stuff on the on the, on, on the lumber that uh, uh, I took off the walls of my studio and everybody did something like that well we didn't expect to sell it we didn't sell anything but we had a lot of fun doing it and the audience uh, the public reacted in a positive way so anyway to make a long story short we had a lot of fun our meetings were really something they should be they should be on film, <laughs> on film. Uh, arguing and fighting and talking and cursing. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And Bob, who was a very motherwell, who was a very sedate gentleman, probably the only gentleman of the group. <laughs> Bob 
just smi sat there and smiled. He loved it. He just <laughs> smiled as if he was watching live theater somewhere. And so we had a great time. And uh, and uh, and I think the uh, the public um, enjoyed participating in in our fun with our fun. All right, Paul. Paul, it's your turn. <laughs> well. Uh... Bogosian called me this morning and said, uh, you're not going to be controversial. Uh, and I'm not going to be controversial. Everything is wonderful. I'm happy, very happy to be here. I was happy to be there. And uh, nice and fluffy. My daughter told me in the car coming over that at that time when she was, I guess, 15 or so, she loved getting out of the car and seeing all the glamorous artists with their drinks on the stairway going up to the back door of the Long Point Gallery, that long stairway, right? And so that gave me a nice feeling about uh, Long Point, which I otherwise don't have. <laughs> That's all I got to say on the subject. I think uh, I could say one thing, uh, which is curious about the gallery. It wasn't made up, uh, most of the Provincetown galleries in the past were Provincetown artists. Now, this gallery had a few Provincetown artists Bogosian, Joby, uh, Motherwell, um, um, Tony Beavers. Who? Tony Beavers. Tony and Tony, right. Those are the Provincetown artists. And Boltman. Leo. Boltman. And Leo and Boltman, right. And the others were all from Wellfleet. And, and uh, Truro. in the old days, Wellfleet and Truro was a very different place. So this was a sort of coming together in the new period. Because when I first came, not when I first came to the Cape, which was in 47, but later when I uh, met my wife in 64, and lived in Truro or Wellfleet in the woods there, I was very aware that there was a great difference between Provincetown and Truro and Wellfleet. The artists hardly, hardly uh, mingled. I think even in the past that was true. I mean, well, you never think of Hopper as a Provincetown artist, whereas, of course, Dickinson and, uh, and Knaths are great Provincetown artists. Uh, why is that? Because he didn't really mingle in Provincetown. So, uh, pro so this gallery was sort of came at a time when uh, everyone thought the, uh, there was very little activity or little, little spirit of the uh, of the town as far as art went, and we were part of the revival of that, and it was a different kind of gallery than I think had ever been there before. Well, I think some of the wonderful things we did were. Uh, tributes that uh, uh, we gave, for instance, to Arthur Berger, the composer, uh, Stanley Kunitz, the poet. Uh, and then uh, we started off by trying to pay our rent by doing uh, uh, posters and uh, originals, uh, and that worked for quite a while. And some of the themes were interesting. I remember Motherwell saying, let's do something with five colors that we would never use. <laughs> that was one. So, in a, way, in a way, yeah, there was a, a, school, a school aspect to the whole thing, too. Uh, but uh, it was a very congenial group, and uh, it, it's, uh, to, to be a part of it, uh, is <laughs> aren't there any questions from the audience? <laughs> yes. Um, what were some of the highlights? Some of the what? The highlights. Highlights. <laughs> some of the highlights. There were none. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Louder. Yeah, you did. 
did. And I think, from what I understand, is those conversations and that coming together was very important to all of you. Now, what was the question? That's good. Yeah. That's true. About uh, how we got together, conversation. And uh, well, that's true, because we were not really of the same school. How we all uh, got together. As far as how we were organized, I was the last person asked in the original group, and I didn't know many of the people at all. I had met Bogosian a few years earlier up at Dartmouth. I never knew Joby. Carmen and I shared a dealer at Perry right. Gallery, but we really didn't know each other, but I had seen his pictures. And uh, I had known Judith Rothschild quite well, and I was a, I hardly knew uh, City or Nora. I just had met them. Uh, of course, Sidney Simon was a great friend of mine. And Leo I didn't know either. So uh, many of these people were new to me. And they all became my friends, as well as colleagues. Yeah. Well, I think our age, had a lot to do with it too. We had we had been in the we had been painting uh, for many years. We had been showing in our you know for instance uh, I knew Carmen from the Whitney Museum before I ever met him. I was in the Whitney Annual. He was in the Whitney Annual, <coughs> and we knew each other. Bugsy of course, uh, Bogosian is a very dear old friend of mine. He's been my friend since '47. But the point is, we we had been through it. We were survivors. We were, were still working. We went through hard times together, separately, but together. And so uh, there was a compatibility there uh, amongst us, mutual respect. And uh, as I say, we were survivors. And the survival rate of, 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 especially in those days, of painters, young painters, surviving as painters uh, was very low. Most of them uh, tr started off as painters and they never made it. And it had nothing to do so much with, 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 with money. Money entered into the picture, but we made the right sacrifices we had to in order to survive. And we never, we didn't get many handouts. Sure, we got scholarships like the Guggenheim and whatever, but that stuff only, that kind of money lasted a year and that was the end of it. But I think there was just a mutual respect and one important factor, uh, we're not really competitive in the gallery. We didn't, uh, at least I, I wasn't aware of it. If somebody sold, uh, he was not, uh, uh, he, he, was, he, he was not placed in a, in, in, a, in a position of materialism, for instance. Rezica sold very well. Never bothered <laughs> me, Paul. <laughs> it helped pay the bills. <laughs> And, but, uh, but actually, I was just beginning to sell my pictures when I, and I hadn't hardly sold my pictures no. when I entered the gallery. I was just beginning. For me, I was not a. Uh, I don't. I didn't think of myself as a survivor. I thought of myself as someone beginning. Well, I you, never you, felt you myself, and I still feel I'm beginning. As a matter yeah, of fact, I'm a beginning. I'd hate to think of myself as a survivor. <laughs> It sounds like that Woody, not Woody Allen, who was that guy in that late night television about well, the survivor? Well, the point is not many guys made it. <laughs> so we survived. Well, I think, Paul, a lot had to do with the hanging committee. <laughs> <laughs> and we really showed you to your best. Uh, but uh, I must say, uh, we did have a wonderful hanging committee, <laughs> Leo Manso and the uh, Frambolutis. And you. Yeah. You know, I like to say, I hear the name uh, Judith Rothschild mentioned. That we had two gals in the, uh, in the gallery. Judith, who was, I think the best description of her came from Paul. He probably forgot he said this. She was one hell of a gal, and she was. We have very good rapport. She came from money, I didn't, but nonetheless, we got along just fine. Judith was a good musician, and she loved music, so we would talk uh, extensively about music. She loved to read, and I loved to read, and so we would talk extensively about books. Uh, she could be uh, 
what's the word? She could get down, so to speak. She could get funky. She, she was a very uh, intelligent and well-informed gal, but she had a very warm uh, personality. Nora was uh, just, uh, just a, a really wonderful person. She had a great sense of humor. She had a kind of a peculiar voice that was kind of charming. And a uh, uh, very good painter. Uh, we had many wonderful times at her place in uh, Wellfleet. And uh, again, both of these gals were wonderful and there was no problems at all along those lines. A wonderful experience. Well, I think one of the, in, I can't, one of the more interesting members of the group was Fritz Boltman. Yeah. His uh, interest in uh, the occult in a different way from Bud Hopkins uh, <laughs> yeah. and his, his interest in, in so many cultures. It was uh, unfortunate that he had to be uh, in pain uh, for so many years, but it was always a pleasure uh, to go up to Miller Hill Road and, and uh, have a, a drink with him and hear him talk and converse. And Motherwell, the same thing. I think my, it was in a way time to close the gallery uh, because the building was up for sale. We sat around the table, I think, arguing or talking about whether we would put in each of us a certain amount. And as I look back, I say to myself, here was Judith with $130 million, <laughs> and, and the damn building was up for sale for 250000 I mean, what the hell held her back? <laughs> And the other, the same thing with Motherwell and the Frambaludis. I mean, they all loved it so much. Why the hell didn't they step forward, you know? I think but it was time. It was time. I better take over and be the conciliator now. <laughs> I would never say a thing like that. I don't I, care. I, I would. Never in my life did I, did I expect that. Well, the thing is, let's get back to, they're all, let's get back to the fluff now. Uh, <laughs> First of all, when he mentions Fritz, Fritz, uh, you're, anyone who hasn't read Fritz's writings on art, what should read them? There's, most writings are, are uh, just gibberish, as I'm concerned. But not Fritz. Fritz really is deep and clear. And uh, he was one of the uh, great students of Hoffman and a great expounder of his ideas and of his own ideas. He was a terrific character. We lost a great man when he went. Yep. He also had great, uh, he was very tough and very odd. His oddness was very important too. He could be hateful. Yes, <laughs> yep. normally. That's what I liked about him. Speaking of. He was bracing. Now the truth We needed comes him out. On, this, yeah. on this panel. But speaking of an odd bird in, in, in the group was Robert Mudwell, a beautifully educated, very elegant, very kind. Very quiet, low-key band. We're we're shouting at each other and screaming and disagreeing, and he just sit back and smile, and and he enjoyed it, and and he became very, we became very close friends. Uh, I became very close friends of his too, because he lived not far from where I live, right across the border, and very often we had dinner together uh, when he was alone. I'd bring over some tripe or something that he liked and, and a bottle of my wine and we'd start talking and I'd start the conversation, I'd ask him a question and then he'd talk and I listened. And he was marvelous, uh, he loved to speak and he, was, he, he shared all of, his, all of his thoughts with you when he talked. But anyway, uh, this, uh, you might be interested to know that beautiful collage of his blue guitar that's right at the entrance uh, the collage element, or one of the part of the collage element, is a musical score that my son wrote and sent to him. My son was a composer at the time, and he was a great admirer of Bob's paintings. And he met him on several occasions, and he loved to hear him speak because he's very curious about that period, the '50s, the New York scene, uh, which Motherwell was an act, played an active part in, and so. 
Bob called me up. Uh, it was in June, I guess, uh, several weeks before he died. And he was very excited. And he said, I just painted the best, made the best collage that I've made. And he said, I'm going up to Provincetown uh, because I want to show it at Long Point. And he said, my doctor warned me not to go to Provincetown, that I should remain in Greenwich near the hospital because he had a heart condition. But he said, I'm going up for a week because I really want to show the painting. And I said, well, that's great. I'm delighted. I'm delighted you used, uh, you were able to use Cham's uh, uh, manuscript. And he, uh, and he, uh, he said, I'll see you in Provincetown. So I heard three days later or four days later that he died. And the only reason why he came up was to show that painting, which he considered his best, the best collage, he said. And uh, I, uh, I came by a week after he died and I saw the painting. It was hanging in Long Point, the first time it had been shown. It was hanging in Long Point. And I, uh, I looked at it and I said, this isn't his best collage. <laughs> I have a better one. <laughs> I, I didn't think it was his best. But I said, he knew what he was talking about. And so I had to find out why he thought it was his best. And I looked at it, and I looked at it, and after about 15 or 20 minutes, I came to a conclusion. Some of you, especially the artists in the group, may disagree with me. But that painting, what he did with that collage is merge his oils with his collage, collage on paper. They were always separate up until that point, I think, at least from what I've seen. There were always the collages were in the collage category and the paintings were in the painting card. And he merged the two. And so what happened was he was opening up a whole new direction. And that, anytime an artist, if you ask an artist, most artists, I know, I don't include this panel. <laughs> if, you, if you ask them what your best painting is, uh, they'll always they'll usually select a painting that you will disagree with. You say, no, I don't think that's the best thing he's done. But usually it's a painting that opened a door for a new direction. It's usually a painting that, not necessarily his best as far as the, the, the viewpoint of the critic, but his best because it's the painting that opened up a direction for him. And I feel that way about my work. The few paintings that I consider my best were the paintings that opened up a whole new horizon for me. And I think that's what Bob meant. I'm not sure, but maybe you can look at it again, some of you who are really interested, and you might have another uh, solution. But my point is, it's the kind of personal relationship that was developed in that gallery. And, we, and he became a personal friend as, well, sort of, these two. <laughs> but we developed a personal relationship for the most part, that 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 that, that is uh, very beautiful, and and uh, it's it's still it's still there. And uh, you know, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about humor and humor in the gallery and humor regarding artists. First of all, there are very few, if any, serious paintings that have humor in them. There are drawings, Picasso's that changed for. Them. Uh, have some bit of humor in some of his drawings. Uh, and there is, of course, humor in the uh, literature, uh, Mark Twain, uh, the Shakespeare, and so forth and so on. And there's humor in a lot of music. No, not a lot of music, but in some music. But there's a difference between the humor in the art and the humor in the artist. M many artists, particularly musicians that I know, are very funny, and many uh, painters are very funny. Uh, one of the funny guys that we know, and anybody that knows Arajan, knows he can be pretty humorous. <laughs> and I'd like to tell one story uh, that uh, I don't exactly remember the occasion that this took place. It was some kind of a celebration. We had made, we just finished making a, um, uh, a print. I think it was a print. And each of us had a work on this print, about this big. 
and there was each artist had his own little statement and so forth. And uh, what was the occasion where this was presented to someone? Do you remember? To Edith. To Edith? When she retired. Yeah, I remember. Okay. When yeah. Edith remember. retired, that's right. So, uh, very well, say who Edith is. is. No, say Edith say Hunter Edith was our first, first director. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, so uh, Verjean presented Edith with a gift. And the gift was this print, this big. And everybody's work of art was neatly cut out, except Verjean's. <laughs> and he presented it to her. Uh, where does that go? I guess, I guess she took it with her, huh? <laughs> Listen, it's an icon for <laughs> Well, there was well you know, generosity, I, want, I, I can't help but stress this, that we weren't, we weren't a little island. It was a pleasure to see our colleagues who were in other galleries coming to our shows, and we would go to their shows, and there, we had invitationals where we uh, asked uh, other artists, not in the group, uh, to show with us. You know, we weren't, we weren't special, special. Uh, uh, this is, this town is art. It, it has been for a long time, and we're part of that scene. Uh, it happens that 13 or 14 of us got together, and uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we used our imagination to do various things. I think we were generous in a lot of ways, uh, but we were part of the, the whole fabric of this town, which made it so damn exciting and interesting. Uh, generosity, I think, is a key element, definitely. Yeah. Many people yeah, thought we were snooty, mm -hmm. and many artists really were very mad not to be asked to be in the gallery. And many would come around and be very, uh, uh, not at all happy with the, <laughs> with our. <laughs> well, you with could us. just fit so many people in the gallery. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. we were a very wide group of people, but still, that's a fact. And I remember, I remember vividly, Freed, uh, among others, yeah. very upset. Yeah, this is a question for Well, I always said uh, that uh, that uh, the main thing for me in the gallery was showing with Motherwell, <laughs> and I don't know how many other people felt that, but because I didn't know Motherwell at all, and I was not a great admirer of Motherwell when I entered the gallery in any way, but I became in, uh, more an admirer by hanging next to him. In other words, my pictures had to look good next to his picture. And that was a big experience for me. I never felt that way. <laughs> uh, I mean, I remember, I remember some of Motherwell's work, but I remember a fantastic show of Dimitri Hadzi in one of the galleries. Fabulous bronzes. I think there were like 15 of them. I installed that room. <laughs> it was a great show. We had many shows. I mean, sure, Motherwell was, uh, was a big known figure, but uh, that, it did, that really didn't matter, believe me. We had unbelievably beautiful shows uh, that had nothing to do with Bob. We all had our own space. 
I mean, you know, by that I mean is when you when you walked in to a meeting or to a, a, an opening or one of our openings, we all felt just as important as each other. I mean, somehow, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, of course. Bob, the beautiful thing about Bob is he never projected his fame or his uh, his place in history in the history of modern art. He's one of us. Yeah. At least that's the way I, I felt, and I was never in awe of him. The only time I was in awe with Bob was when he talked and when he showed his paintings. I mean, you're in awe of his paintings, but he was gifted, and everybody in that gallery was gifted in his own way. You know, I've been thinking, now that I'm no longer a young man, I've been thinking about old age, and I've been thinking about uh, uh, how critical I've been about other artists. If I didn't like the work, I'd say it's, it's junk. If I didn't like, uh, if I saw an amateur uh, uh, amateur show, just dilettantes, I'd say that's all garbage. It isn't. It's all valid. All of it. Every single bit of it. One time I was asked to curate a watercolor show, annual water uh, exhibition at, at, at the uh, uh, Art Association, and I hate to do that sort of thing, and I agreed to. And there were so many paintings, just painted by part-time painters, by hobbyists, some by people with professional aspirations, a real mixed bag. And that show was so important to them. Once a year they had a chance to show their work in a community where they lived or they certainly visited. And I didn't have the heart to turn anyone down. I put every single person in that show, <laughs> including, including, including Renzica. <laughs> he had a watercolor. <laughs> he had a watercolor. So did Tony Beaver. You know, the whole, what can I say? Yes, the whole crew. But everyone, I turned down one person. And yes, it was a, who, why? It was, I, don't, why? I don't know who he was. I'll tell you why. It was you a very, a lot of friends. it was supposed <laughs> to be a watercolor show. Oh, I see. And it was the most commercial, it was a very slick, <laughs> fairly, fairly well done, slick commercial job. But he used acrylic. So that's why I got, so I, I dropped him. If it was a watercolor, I would have kept But I let everybody in. I figured this is their one chance to show their work, many of them. And I, I didn't have the heart to, to turn them all down, and I just piled them up, and it was yeah, but fine. But still, still the, the hanging committee at the Long Point was very special. Yes. They had a great connection. <laughs> I mean, it's the Frombos and Leo and Bogos. They were a fantastic hanging committee. So much so that every show I've ever had, any yeah. big show, I would get Bogosian to hang it from that experience. However, when I saw this show here, the Motherwell show is the way the Lawn Point was hung. It was sparse. Everything could yeah. be seen. Now this yeah. show here, because of the amount of work, is not hung like a, like a Lawn Point show, even though, uh, even though Varjan did it. <laughs> well, the Lawn Point shows, they were so critical. They took so long <laughs> over just, just hanging 20 pictures, or 14 pictures, actually. Sometimes they took that whole day, yeah. and I we would see them work when I come in. Sometimes to see how they did it, yeah. every little inch was accounted for, and I, that's the feeling you get in that show over there. Yeah, but the thing is this: the conditions were that every member should have two pieces of work in the show. We're talking a about large, this show. Yeah, well, you got a, a large problem. piece and a small piece. What the hell can you do when you only have two galleries? <laughs> You know, I mean, really. <laughs> well, yes. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like when you hung the shows during the long point years, uh, how did you organize who showed when and how many pieces? And you spoke in a couple of you have spoken about the hanging committee, but what was your committee structure? Were there other committees and did they work as smoothly? Just a little bit of the nuts and bolts. How did we go about hanging? Well, yeah, were there other committees? There were no other show? committees. No other committees. It was just the hanging committee. No, no other committees, my God. Manso, <laughs> Manso, the Frambolutis, and myself. That was it. The artists would bring in the work, 
and they had nothing to say about installation. In fact, exactly. they weren't even allowed in, in the room. That's right. And we would install the two shows. Now, occasionally, <laughs> a petulant artist, <laughs> I don't want to mention his name, B.H., <laughs> B.H., <laughs> would say, I want, and we would give in. Bud Hopkins was not easy to get along with. However, he was a great storyteller. <laughs> and especially about U U UFOs. UFOs. Oh, oh. Well, he was a great teller of jokes. And a great oh, teller was, of jokes, yeah. yeah. We exchange jokes yeah. all the time. But you know, uh, as members passed on, we took in uh, new members joined. Gil Franklin was a fabulous addition. So was Mike Mazur. Uh, Beecham, Bob Beecham. Bob Beecham and the big Paul Bowen. Yeah, uh, these were great, great additions. They didn't really speak up much at meetings, though, did they? No, we wouldn't let them. Yeah. <laughs> They were, they were a little intimidated by the meetings. And one more question, please. Yes. I'm trying to envision how this group of artists had meetings. What were they like? Were they meetings? And how did you decide on like, the theme of a show that would be? Well, yes. Uh, we would have our meetings. <laughs> and then we'd say, well, we have to do a theme next year. Uh, what the hell were some of our themes? Scary, <laughs> scary paintings, those frightening did, paintings. Did we do? Th no, we didn't do that, did we? Yes, no. ghosts are called. Something like ghosts it was called. Ghosts, there was one thing yeah, about ghosts. ghosts. I, I, ghosts. I will say this. Many <laughs> of those meetings started out as meetings, and they ended up as parties. <laughs> because uh, I forget who introduced uh, uh, cheap champagne. We brought some cheap champagne in there. And by the end of the meeting, uh, <laughs> we forgot it was a, it was a meeting. But uh, it, was, it was very pragmatic. It kind of just yeah. moved along, and somebody said one thing, and somebody said another, and then what do you all think about that? Okay, I'm for that. No, I'm not for that, and blah, blah, blah. And it just went kind of uh, rambled on. And, and, it very and, and Tony Vivers was our president. Mm -hmm. He was very... Uh, Kind and understanding. <laughs> he was <laughs> very frustrated yeah. at times. <laughs> yeah. But we uh, we had uh, we had shows like uh, uh, one was uh, invite your favorite artists. Oh right, right. That was good. And uh, uh, we invite mostly local artists. Yeah. Uh, one person would invite one person. I think I invited Sal. I'm I invited Sal. I invited Sal. <laughs> I invited Sal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, then we had another show called Opposites. Opposites. You had to invite an artist who painted completely opposite way than the way you did. I invited yeah. Aniskevich. Aniskevich, right. Mm -hmm. And that Anna was Skevich, a very interesting Anna show. Aniskevich came here in 48 to study with Henry Henschel. He lived in the same building. He lived we in lived. Shangri La with us. Yeah. Yeah. Sal and. Yeah. Ray and Ed lived upstairs. We were downstairs. Yeah, we had great parties. Pity the poor immigrant. <laughs> yeah, the we, poor but uh, so we had some very interesting yeah. shows that uh, you, you wouldn't think, especially uh, I thought Opposites was an uh, interesting show. Well, there was a show, Homeric Themes, very beautiful show. Oh, right, that's right. Great Day Studies. Mm -hmm. Did we do that? Yeah. How awful. Really? Yeah, that was a good idea. I hate that. Yeah. I thought it wasn't. Yeah, it, about awful things we did. Well, wasn't it when the sun wasn't out, Henshi would have them doing great days? Day. Absolutely. Precisely. Right. Yeah. That's a nice the idea. Colors are right? more beautiful yeah, yeah. on a great day than the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about all those hard. whistlers in How Venice? About hard. Whistlers, something else. And they're great. <laughs> yeah, they're a different grade than yeah. Henshi. Are <laughs> they? More questions, please. Please. Yes. Well, I keep coming on the same thing with colleagues. This is a good question, but do you think that the long point in general inspired new work? And well, I know your work involves the best, but or do you think it was your own inner inspiration, not the long point? Did she say over? 
my work had a great impact on the other members. <laughs> Another question. <laughs> Another question, please. <laughs> yes. When you talk to younger artists today whose careers are just kicking off, they get very excited about the idea of an artist run co op and really putting artists in charge of their own careers. But they worry that if all the artists are the ones in charge of the business side, that nothing will ever actually get done. Could you talk a little bit about the actual business side, as I mentioned, the nuts and bolts of how sales worked? Was anything sold? Oh, yeah, sure. Lots. It was very successful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. very we successful. Sold a lot of stuff. And I forget the commission that the gallery took. Was it, it wasn't a third. It was less, I think. 25? 25% no, maybe. 25. And our posters, we, we sold our posters. Um, whenever we couldn't come up with the full amount with, with sales or, say, posters, we would contribute our finan yeah. financial. I think, I think a Tony and, uh, and Mary took care of the... Uh, the business part, yeah. as I remember. I and, know I didn't. <laughs> and I think if, if certain artists couldn't yeah. come up with the money, we always, that was taken kind of care of. For them, yeah. But, yeah. but usually co-op galleries, the ones that, the old Tanager Gallery in New York, there are a number of them, the artists had turns uh, 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 sitting at the desk and taking care of potential clients, opening up the gallery. They oh, had turns. But we didn't do that here. No. 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 And they also <laughs> had turns in doing all the work, cleaning the gallery, uh, sending out the notices, and some of them lasted quite a while. T Tanager, for instance, lasted a long time, mm -hmm. and, and they were very well liked. The co-ops were very li well liked by the critics. Yeah. The critics always wrote, uh, wrote up the shows, and... Uh, and the art and public, uh, the, 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 the uh, gallery goers also enjoyed going to co-ops because again, they felt, well, this is a gallery that's run by the artists and, and they get all of the money from the sales. And a lot of, they were very sympathetic to co-ops. And uh, it could be done very easily. You just have to commit. It's a question of commitment. Everyone has to commit a certain amount of time yeah, but this was different. We didn't do that. No, no. Uh, she speaking just, of the long part, we had nothing no, to do with no. that. So it was a quite a cure. It's a good question about the nuts and bolts. I don't really know how the hell it ran. <laughs> it really is amazing that it ran for so long. Didn't we pay the director a salary? We paid yes. some salary, didn't we? Yeah, oh, yeah. And she oh, got yeah. a commission in That's sales. Yeah. Yeah. But don't forget, our gallery was only for two months, three months of the year. That's right, yeah, that's true. It wasn't a 12-month operation. Did we, did we show every three years? I can't remember. Every two years, I think, it every worked out. Every two years? Well, well the shows so. only lasted a week or so. Well, no, no, they lasted no? two weeks. Two weeks? Okay. Absolutely. Two weeks. The, other, the other thing is the Maybe American Legion longer. was very understanding. The, the rent they yeah. charged us was very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that the main thing with the cooperative gallery are the members themselves. If you don't have a compatible group, forget about it. I think the way uh, the, long point, uh, the long point survived is uh, because we had a bunch of people that got along very well and had good senses of humor and uh, the temperaments worked and we had long experience. I think with younger people it would be more difficult. Uh, because they're all striving uh, to um, uh, to achieve and to gain money and fame and so forth and so on and become very competitive. Yeah. Uh, so I, that would be a, that's that's where the problem is. Yeah. Competitiveness is probably the biggest problem. Yeah. The Long Pond Gallery, you weren't aware of competitiveness at all. Maybe once in a while you say, "Gee, there." Resica just sold another pen. But usually, usually, there was no competition. I wasn't aware of this. How did I know? Now the truth comes out. I thought they all were selling. I didn't know. I knew. By the way, if you want to know about co op girls, you should investigate the Frombos or the people who really knew all about it because they ran the landmark gallery. Uh, down on Broom Street right. for many years. Right.
or they were they were part of the Latin Mass, <coughs> so they really had a whole feeling about yeah. it, and knew how to run it. Yeah. yeah. There was one exceptional gallery in New York that most of you have never heard of. Eleanor Roosevelt started it, and it was part of the WPA program during the uh, 30s. You know, uh, the, the, the government uh, 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 took care through the various programs, the Roosevelt administration, unemployed people. You know, the CCCs, they put them to work, uh, the young men to work, uh, uh, building roads, planting trees, and there were programs for the workers, for the unemployed. There's nothing for the creative people, for artists, musicians, writers. And Eleanor Roosevelt insisted that they have to eat too, and we have to set up programs for the arts. And she did. And uh, one of the programs was uh, opening a gallery in New York called the Artist Gallery. Uh, volunteers, professional people, uh, volunteered to work in the gallery uh, you know, a, a, a day or two a week. They would select artists who were not affiliated to, with a gallery, who they thought were promising, and they would give the artists a show. The artists would be a part of the gallery. They give them a one-man show every two years, give them all of the money from the sales, and keep them on until they found a professional gallery in New York. <laughs> and the critics loved it. The uh, artists loved it. Those who had had shows there and those who, who just knew about it. The, uh, uh, the big collectors loved it. I had a show there and Roy Newberger bought a couple of paintings, Joe Hirschhorn bought a couple of paintings. The reviews were always good. And it was a wonderful, wonderful organization. And somebody should write a book about it. And it finally closed down, I think it was in the 60s. But Eleanor Roosevelt was responsible for that. And she, know about that one? she was yeah, the first to think, well, artists have to eat too. You went through all the time. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> a lot of people so that was a co-op in a sense. A co-op. Uh, it wasn't a commercial it, gallery. Yeah. They sold huh? things. Nothing. They had one show there uh, once a year. They'd have ask artists to contribute drawings, and then they'd have a big sale, and all the money would go towards supporting the gallery. Unsigned drawings. They were all a hundred dollars each. There were the Koonings in the in, in, in the show. Every artist who was known at the time supported the gallery and gave drawings, unsigned drawings. Bud Hopkins took over a group of people, and right away he spotted the goodies. He bought about six of the best before anyone had a chance to. He to was buy a it. troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that was another type of a co op gallery. So uh, there have been successful uh, enterprises. Yeah. Well, I think so, we have time for one more question. No. No? Thank you very much.